All right, today, um, today's going to be fun. I'm looking forward to this interview. This is a dude I grew up on his music. Um, and, you know, I actually called about three different people to get his information because I was like, you, I, I just want to sit and talk to somebody who I have listened to his music. I've seen his work for so many years of my life. Um, producer, writer, um, rapper, <laughs> please welcome. Queen's own Kwame. Kwame, what, what up? What up, what up? What's going on, brother? I'm good. I'm good. Good to have you in the building, man. Yeah, thank you for having me. Thank you for having me for sure. Yeah, I'm gonna tell you, Kwame, I love your background. Yeah, the, right, right now, you you I, I feel like I gotta step my game up so crazy <laughs> looking at your background. But this back this just represents me. I'm I'm still a 12-year-old kid. <laughs> so <laughs> this is my this is this is my sanctuary. Now, nah, I'm going to tell you if you if you ever see me on future shows and I got arcades, games and 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 toys do it. in the background, just know you the inspiration. Yeah, man, do it. Do it. Do it. Do it. I love it. I love it. All right, yo, I'm going to take it backwards for a second. There's a lot I want to talk to you about today, but um East Elmhurst Queens. Yes. What is it about Queens that has produced so many so rappers, so much dope talent in the industry. Well, let me, I, I rep my neighborhood so hard. So let me give you a background of this neighborhood. So it's East Elmhurst. So if anybody that doesn't know, it's the LaGuardia Airport, right? If you know LaGuardia Airport, the neighborhood in LaGuardia Airport is East Elmhurst, Queens. Um, where you see ever you see videos with the big globe or the, you know the, the the earth globe in the in the park and all that stuff. Yep. So so East Elmhurst is adjacent to another neighborhood called Corona. So East Elmhurst, we pretty much consider it the same neighborhood. Corona is one side, East Elmhurst is another side. And within East Elmhurst Corona, you have the stadium where Mets play, you have the stadiums where the um US Open is, you have um LaGuardia Airport and that neighborhood in the late 40s it was predominantly Italian and Jewish and in the late 40s when black mainly artists started making money they started to migrate out to Queens and East Elmhurst was one of the spots. So Louis Armstrong lived in East Elmhurst. Um, Willie Mays, the great baseball player, lived in East Elmhurst. Harry Belafonte lived in East Elmhurst. Ella Fitzgerald lived in East Elmhurst. Um, um, so many other people. Martin Scorsese is from Corona. Um, and a lot of these people started to migrate into East Elmhurst. And as time went on, um, Nancy Wilson lived in East Elmer. So as time went on, those people moved out. They got started making more money and moved into to bigger places. But, um, oh, Malcolm X lived in East Elmhurst. Malcolm X lived on my block in East Elmhurst. That was the house that, that got bombed, was literally up the block from my house, literally up the block. So, so, and that's 97th street in East Elmhurst. And, um, so we already have in like uh, the the DNA of this neighborhood, and like I said, it's not it's not a rich neighborhood at all. It's a middle class neighborhood. So by the time I'm growing up in the '80s, it's now my parents are from East Elmhurst. So when they were growing up, it was fifty fifty black white. When I was growing up, it was probably seventy thirty black white. Some some Latinos started to move in. But in my time, we had um, the older cats were Herbie Lovebug, who is the producer for Salt and Pepper and Kid and Play. So it was Herbie. We had um, our ice cream man. The ice cream man is Eric B. Eric B. and Rakim. Um, oh. um, play, Kid. Um, Herbie's girlfriend is Salt, so she's in the neighborhood. Her best friend is Pepper, so she's in the neighborhood. Um, LL had a, a rap group that was from the neighborhood. So LL was in the neighborhood. 
um, on the other side in Corona is Cool G Rap, DJ Polo. So these are the like the 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 older people in the neighborhood. And 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 so when hip hop is starting to make moves, the first person to get put on was Herbie. Technically, Herbie mm-hmm. and Eric were like the first two people to get put on. So so to see that firsthand is an amazing thing to see like Eric B and Rakim, like the first time ever exposed to Eric B and Rakim, you see these little flyers for, for their record and, or, or kid and play. Like everybody seemed to get put on in like late 85, like everybody in the neighborhood. So Herbie has salt and pepper and they put out their, their group was called super nature at first. Yeah, so, yeah. so super nature was out with their first record showstopper. Kid and Play wasn't Kid and Play yet. They were called Fresh Force, and they had a record called Rock Me off of that Rock Me Amadeus record. And then Eric B. had Eric B. as president. And then Cool G Rap has It's a Demo and I'm Fly. So those records were all out at the same time from all these cats in the neighborhood. And then um, from there, Salt and Pepper takes off, Kid and Play takes off, you know, everybody starts taking off and me being younger, um, Herbie's younger brother was my best friend in school. And so Steve would bring me around Herbie and I got to see like all of that, like firsthand. It was amazing, man. Yo, it's so crazy because I always wondered what was the connection between you and Herbie? Yeah. You you actually went to school with his younger brother. Is Is, is his younger brother that actually introduced you to him? Yeah, so so how I know Herbie, we all went to the we all went to this Catholic school. It's funny, I'm a Muslim and I went to Catholic school. But um we all went to this we all went to this Catholic school and it was like the neighborhood it was like the neighborhood school. Like you had a choice whether you go to it was either PS one twenty seven in the neighborhood or Saint Gabriel's. And if you could get into Saint Gabriel's, you go into Saint Gabriel's. So G-Rap went to St. Gabriel's, Play went to St. Gabriel's, Herbie went to St. Gabriel's, I went to St. Gabriel's, um, and Herbie's little brother, Steve. But since, like I said, the other guys are so much older, they're like seven, eight years older than me, um, me and Steve were cool. But Herbie, how I met Herbie, Herbie was, we had an eighth grade prom, and Herbie was the DJ. Herbie oh. was the DJ. Your guy, you know, um, hitman Ron Lawrence, Ron Lawrence, lived on my block you know what i'm saying ron was on 97th street as well ron was on one side of 97th street and the malcolm x house was on the other side so herbie and ron did the, did the the eighth grade prom herbie brings cheryl salt we thinking salt is our age so we all trying to bag salt at the eighth grade prom <laughs> you know so i'm saying that's how deep our history is you know and 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 you know, we used to have park jams, just like, you know, uptown and anywhere else. And Herbie used to have a crew called the um, the Turnout Brothers. And it was Herbie and, Pl- no, Herbie and Kid, I believe. And Play was in another crew called the Super Lovers. And, and those were like the neighborhood MCs, you know? So we all, Ron, I think Ron was in, Ron might've been in the Super Lovers as well. He was Ronnie Damn, Tuck. I didn't know that. Yeah. Ronnie Tough, <laughs> that was his name, <laughs> and 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 so, you know, it was just a community, man. It was a community, and then when hip hop started becoming things, you know, it became a hip hop community. And um, you know, after and then when a lot of some of the Latinos started to move in, you had like the Beat Nuts. The Beat Nuts are from Corona, um, and and um, uh, Salam Remy is is oh. further up in corona uh a little bit past corona is nori and capone you know so so you know the other neighborhood right next to us flushing you have dreads from F- black sheep you have um large professor so if you expand this neighborhood to the five surrounding neighborhoods within you know and everything is 10 minutes away so it ain't like they hikes. You can walk to some of these people, other neighborhoods from from a central location. So, um, yeah, man, it was just it was just a crazy, crazy, crazy time. 
You know, it's crazy because I'm, I'm from the Bronx and mm -hmm. uh, hip hop has been part of my DNA since birth, damn near. Yeah. Um, but you got to give it to Queens. I'm sitting here listening to you and you're talking about early rappers that dominated the game. We didn't even yeah. get to the era. Like you touched on the the uh, Capone and Noriegas. We didn't even get to you know, 50 and, 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 and so many of the other legends that then came out like Queens. It is something in that water. I mean, you could have even went backwards and and, and and run run DMC and yeah yeah it's Queens is bananas when it comes to rappers. I think between Brooklyn and Queens, I think Brooklyn Brooklyn is, is well I know why I think I know why about Brooklyn, but with Queens Queens is the outside of Staten Island, and then you know Wu Tang fixed that, but outside <laughs> of Staten Island, Queens was the last people looked at. Yes, I yes. think I think. As Queens cats, when we would go uptown, and we, you know, we would go into Harlem, we go uptown, we go into the Bronx, and even sometimes we go into Brooklyn, we were the, almost the targets. So it's like, nah, you know what I'm saying? We gotta, I think, and and to move further into time, I think that's why the South dominates so much because they were the last to be looked at. So when you're the last to be looked at, you're trying to get first in line. And so 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 I think the mentality I think the the subconscious mentality of Queens rappers was you're going to see us. And and you're going to see us in in the biggest way you possibly can because it seems like it's a given when you think hip hop you'd say Bronx, Harlem, hip hop Yep. You know, us Queens kids, you know, me being me being at, at the Rucker in 85 or, or you know what I'm saying? It's like an unheard of thing. Most Queens kids wouldn't even think about going into Harlem for anything. Yo, there's a party at PS whatever, whatever, I'm going. And they're like, you going? I'm like, yeah, I'm going. I got friends in Harlem, you know, so so or or the Bronx and and so it's like I think it's like that. It's like a proving ground. It's like you have to, you really want to prove it. No, you know, I, I sat down with Search, um, and he's yeah. another one I can mention. I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't even bring his name up. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I asked Search a similar question, and he had the exact same answer. You know, just phrased it a little differently, but he's like, yo, you know, we were kind of overlooked. So we, we really had to go out there and prove ourselves. And that was the mentality of so many of them artists that came up out of Queens, obviously, because y'all came and y'all came with it hard. Like, and, and, and yeah. still continue to produce great talent. Um, You know something? You, you play actual instruments, correct? Yes. Okay, so you, you at the time that um you came out, you, you were known as a rapper, but you produced more than half of your album. Did, all did, of them. I did, did all, 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 all of them. All yeah. of the first album? Yes. Okay. By default, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and we're going to go into that. I just wanted to dig in a mindset at this point. Because on the West Coast, Dre was doing his thing. But it yeah. wasn't as common as it is today to, to be a producer and an artist. Did you see yourself more as an artist, as a producer, or did you just produce by default because you wanted to be an artist and didn't have nobody to make beats. My, 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 um, my touchstones, my, my, my artistic touchstones was Stevie Wonder and Prince, right? So as a kid, I'm looking at, I'm, I'm a studier. I study, like I study music. So I'm buying Prince albums. I'm buying so Jack and my mom's old Stevie Wonder albums. And on the back, it says produced, performed, produced, arranged, and composed by Prince, yep. Stevie Wonder. So in my mind, that's what you're supposed to do. Because my introduction to it was artists like that. And I always gravitated toward artists that did that, pre-rap. 
So when somebody would tell me, oh, no, he don't write his songs. Uh, oh, no, he don't play the music. In my brain, I'm like, for real? Like, what? You just, who does it? And, you know, and then you start. So so the idea of a producer was never in my head. The, the, the functionality of a producer. Yeah, you start, I think, if you don't know what a producer is, you start knowing what a producer is because Quincy Jones did Thriller and you're like, okay, that's a producer. So, you know, if you're not really seeing or figuring it out, figuring it out. And even then it was like, okay, but Michael Jackson likes the songs. So it's like, so I thought, you know, most of them he did, but some of them he didn't. And so I'm looking at all these, these icons out there. You, it could be anybody, anybody. If, if you're looking at 70s music up to mid 80s music, there was a musicality in almost every artist. Yes. You know, yeah. Whether it's pop, whether it's R&B, you know, I, I grew up in a jazz household. So every single artist my father played, wrote and played their music. You know, it was just a, a thing. Um, you know, and on, and on the other side, like I said, my mom was a super Stevie Wonder head. So it's like, you know, so it's like, that's what I'm exposed to. And then when hip hop comes along, as a kid, I'm just like, how is this getting made? Like, I don't understand it. Like, I know, like in my mind, I don't know what a Lin drum looks like, or I don't know what a, a, you know, any of these drum machines look like. I know turntables. I know how that goes down um, because that's what we see. We go to the park as DJs, but the, the actual record making of hip hop boggled my mind. And the first, my first exposure to hip hop is the very first exposure to hip hop, which is like Sugar Hill Gang, Furious Five, where they're playing instruments. It's a band playing these records. Yep. So I'm like, all right, it sounds like it's a real band. I'm, I'm, and so as I evolve, and I, then now I'm 16, 15, 16, and I know what things are and everything. I'm like, well, I guess, you know, now I got to do that and my exposure to equipment like that was through herbie like herbie had all the equipment first herbie had the 808 he had you know a dx drum machine he was the first one to have the sampling sp12 drum machine so honestly you know i i, I tell the story from time to time when herbie would go on tour i would steal his equipment like <laughs> no no lie we'd sneak in his room i would jack the 808 jack the, the the sp or whatever and teach myself how to use it so when it was time to when it was time to um go into the studio and rock out i knew the records i wanted to sample i knew everything that i wanted to do and and actually the first album was made as a demo um herbie's little brother had a girlfriend and her mother was in the industry and the mother told me about this studio in queens and I went to the studio and um, the only time I can get is weird. I went to the studio, I asked him, how much time can I get for this amount of money? I dumped money on the table because <laughs> I work. I was working at a sea town and I stacked up my checks and it was like, I don't know. I don't know. It could have been a hundred dollars for all I know. And he was like, well, I can give you eight hours on Christmas. Like what? <laughs> and it was Christmas morning, midnight, December 25th to 8 a.m. December 25th. I was like, I'll take it. And and I went and I knocked out six of the eight cuts that are on my first album. So that was, I figured, I was, I was supposed oh, to- Hold on, within those eight hours? Yeah, yeah, I knew exactly what I wanted first... to do. Are you serious? Yeah, I had the rhymes memorized. I knew what I wanted to do. I was there to work, man. I was. I figured this is the only time I'm gonna ever get. So I had did to knock have, it out. Did you have the beats made? Ahead of time? No, no, I made them. I made them. I knew exactly. I was like, look, I ain't got no time to play. Line it up. You know? <laughs> so you made the beats, laid the vocals in a eight, in six of those cuts in an eight hour period. Yes. Yes. Oh my God. I, I don't even know how I did it because I think about it now, just like recording now, and I'm like, how the hell did I do that? <laughs> I, I don't even know. Like, I did it, and, and um, I brought that demo to Herbie. And Herbie was like, I can get a deal with this. And he went and got, he actually got two deals. It was weird. 
I'm, I know I'm all over the place with it, but it was real weird. I'm 15 going on 16, right? Mm-hmm. My parents are getting divorced. So, no, my parents, yeah, they're in the dead in the middle of a divorce. My father, we leave Queens. We go to Inglewood, New Jersey. Another magical neighborhood, by the way. Yes. Another one. Yes. I'm, so, I'm listening to you like, you, you're destined to do yeah. something great. So I'm in Inglewood, New Jersey. And I make this demo. I hand this demo to Herbie. Don't think nothing of it. My father hears the demo and he was like, I got a friend whose wife that works at Sony. I was like, who? He was like, Mr. DaCosta. His wife, Mr. DaCosta works at, she's the head of marketing at Sony. I was like, for real? So he gives the, the, the demo to Mr. DaCosta. Think nothing of it. I play the demo for my friends at school. One of my classmates is like, yo, you know, my mom's is in the music industry. She would love to put this out. I'm like, your mom's? What's your mom? What's your mom's though? My mom's is Sylvia Robinson. What? Are you serious? Yeah, my boy Rondo. Okay, Sil- Sylvia Robinson. Yeah, so my boy Rondo holding this secret the whole time. I'm like, for real? He's like, yeah. So in Inglewood, New Jersey, my best friend is the rapper Redhead Kingpin. Me and Redhead were like Starsky and Hutch. As soon as I got to Jersey, we we met each other and we hung started hanging out. So Red was like, yeah, man, she's starting a new label. They signing me too. I'm like, word? So I go over there and it's the first time I'm ever exposed to anything music industry at this point. Outside of Herbie, I walk in, it's a mini mansion. There's a Ferrari in the back on bricks, no tires. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, what? It was like the, the Magnum PI Ferrari with no tires. <laughs> um, some 80s Rolls Royce. A maid answers the door. I'm like, yo. <laughs> Sylvia comes down and she's like, yeah, I want to sign you. We got two other acts. You know, your boy Redhead Kingpin, he just signed. I was like, word. I'm like, he holding out. And you got this other group from Jersey. They called the New Style. New style is naughty by nature. Naughty so, by nature. So I'm like, oh, word. And I'm thinking I'm going to be on the label with my best friend. We can go on the road, get chicks. <laughs> you know, that's all I'm <laughs> thinking about. So she handed me this contract. It was like two pages. It was one full page and one half page. <laughs> oh, word. <laughs> so hold Again, on. That day, she just handed you. No yeah, more she handed me this random contract because I had given Rondo the demo for mom, the mom. She liked uh-huh. it. So right after that, Herbie hits me up and is like, yo, Epic Records likes it and Atlantic Records likes it. We're going to meet with both of them. So we meet with Epic. I can't remember the um, the um, the lady who we met with. I'm sorry. She was like a, a, a head of A&R at Atlantic. It was one of the, one of the earlier black a and A&R heads at, 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 um, at Epic. But then I met with Sylvia Rohn at Atlantic and we had like a super long meeting. I'm like, Sylvia remind me of my mom. <laughs> so we, we talk and talk and talk and I said, I want to go with, I want to go with Atlantic. So they get a contract drawn up. So within like two weeks, I get this 400 page contract. Then within another two weeks, I don't tell my parents nothing. Then within another two weeks, Mr. Costa, hits me up and was like with like this weird like deal memo it wasn't like a contract it was like a rights and refusal type deal memo and that was like i don't know 10 pages so i got the two page sugar hill the 10 page sony and the 400 page atlantic in my book bag every day for like a month i don't tell my pops because I'm staying with my pops. I don't tell my pops nothing. And everybody's beating me up. So I had to tell my pops and I put the papers down. I'm like, look, this is what's going on. And he's like, okay, I'm on it. So he puts the divorce lawyer on (laughs) on the contract. So the divorce lawyer signs the Atlantic Records joint. And and 
that's a speed. I'm just speedballing. But uh -huh. back to your question about the producing thing, Herbie was just too busy. So when it was time to go into the studio and I can either sit and wait to get, I don't know, push it 2.0 and rap over that, or I'm going, I'm going to, I pretty much redid everything that was on the demo. I didn't use the actual two track, whatever the, the, the eight tracks from the demo. I, you know, I upgraded to 24 tracks and um, kept the good parts of the demo and then completed the album. Now, in hindsight, I believe, I believed that I was producing the record, which I was. Mm -hmm. But after things were done, Herbie did step in and was like, like I have like one of my records, The Rhythm. When when I was a kid, I was a lyrical, lyrical dude. I was not about the fun and games at all. And on one side, and then on the other side, I was a, like a heavy storyteller, um, but very explicit. And and Herbie was like, yo, dude, you're 16 years old, man. You cannot be out here talking about ass. Like, like come on, man. Um, so he would come in and kind of like tweak, help make me redo vocals and tweak like the rhythm, make it more lighthearted. Cause I was like, ah, I was like trying to get at you. And he was just like, nah, I was like, ease it back. You know, you know, you're doing, Think about chicks, like ease it back, you know, and he put me on that whole, you know, real happy rap path. Um, and so I would give him credit for that vocal production and, 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 and that. But then after that, you know, he would show up to approve a mix that I was sitting five days, you know, because back then it took three to five days to mix a record. Yep. You know, I'm like, yo, I'm sitting here all this time doing homework and mixing a record, and hey, you come on day five to say yes or no. Man, get out of here. <laughs> but um, but yeah, that's pretty much how it was done. Yo, this story is so crazy. Okay, so I I, I gotta ask you. You went with Atlantic. Do yeah. you remember how much you signed for? Sixty thousand dollars. How much of that was in advance? Um, I got an eleven thousand two hundred dollar advance. <laughs> I remember what, and, and I didn't. I was scared to cash it. I was walking around with an eleven thousand dollar check for like three weeks in my pocket. I'm like, yo, I don't know what I'm gonna get. I'm gonna get a fat rope. <laughs> That's all I was thinking about. I'm gonna get this medallion, <laughs> and I'm gonna get a. I don't know. I wanted a. I wanted a Volks. I got a Volkswagen. I got a convertible Volkswagen. <laughs> That's no, what I got. You're my telling me. See, this is the crazy thing, but we talking 89. Yeah. And we also talking the, the, the very early stages of this new genre of music called rap that we know yeah. is a billion dollar industry today, but you signed a deal back then for $60,000 with Yo. an $11,000 advance? $60,000 and that was to make a, that was to make an EP. And I turned in an album. I was like, I ain't coming out with no EP. <laughs> so I turned in a whole <laughs> album. Which was only eight cuts, but they wanted me to do five. So I'm like, nah, nah, I'm gonna make an album. Like, you can't be having like what's an EP? I, I thought it was like a sucker move. Like, what the hell is an EP? <laughs> um, and so so yeah, it was sixty thousand for that. And then it doubled for the next album, but still, still no, I, I, you at, know, at sixteen years old. You got eleven thousand dollars in your pocket. You think I'm a millionaire? Like, bottom line. This yeah, I didn't. Yeah, I didn't know what to do. And, but luckily, I wasn't on the dummy stuff, so I didn't like trick it out. Matter of fact, the the main thing I did was put aluminum siding on my mom on my mom's home. That's what the most of the money went to. Now Are you I think serious? About it. I put aluminum siding on the home. I bought a fifteen hundred dollar fat rope that I never wore, and and I wore it on the album cover, <laughs> and tucked in a sweater in a in a shirt, and um, I I got a car, 
The car was the car was twenty two thousand, and I probably put five thousand on it and paid it off like that summer or something crazy. That's it. Oh, and rims. I got a rims and a Benzy yeah, box. Rims, <laughs> rims and a Benzy box. Huh? Your first car was a Volkswagen. Yep. Volkswagen Cabriolet convertible. And, and your and man Puff jacked me. Your man Puff saw my yeah. car and went and got the same car. I know he did it because he told me he jacked. <laughs> oh, no. Gets a good I remember when Puff was driving around in that drive. He got the he got the maroon one. And I was like, come on, man. Come on. I was like, yo, why you hold up, hold up. Because 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 I'm gonna actually ask him this. You telling me that he jacked it from you? 100 percent 100 percent 100 percent Don't let him lie. Do not let him lie about that. He definitely jacked. Because I was the only one with the convertible Volkswagen. Only one. And I was all over the place. I was uptown. I was in Yonkers. I was all Puff seen the car and he wanted the car and he jacked it. Trust me. I used to drive. I used to drive. Me and Puff, I'm not even going to blow nobody up, but me and Puff used to know the same people in a particular dorm in Howard. So when I would be in the dorm, he would be at the dorm and I'd pull up and he was like, oh man, that car's dope. Yeah, do not jack me, man. He wouldn't <laughs> turn around and jack me. Oh man. Okay. Oh, crazy story. Yo, this dude Puff, he been at it for years, man. Like, come on, P, you're jacking my man's ride, his whip. Come on, ride. man. It's just a Volkswagen. <laughs> oh my God. All right. Um, and, and here's the crazy thing, because people don't realize just how far back people go. You you yeah, told yeah. Me, you were seeing Puff when he was in Howard. Like, yeah. You don't realize, like, like you see people and they blow, and you think that they just blew out of nowhere. It's yeah, so yeah. much history. Yeah, he would be on. Come on, man, he would be on the road with us if I was doing shows with with Father MC. Puff would be right. That's how I know him. Like I don't know him through anything else, but Howard and and on the road with Father. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Oh man. Um. Where did that? Oh. I know where I want to go because you you spoke about the rhythm. Yeah. And I remember that video vividly, vividly. You was always a fly dude. Like, like your your fashion sensibilities was always ahead. You was wearing a suit in the rhythm. Like, yeah, like, I, was, I was the worst with that. <laughs> yeah. What what 16 year old, like, like, where does that come? Because back in them days. It wasn't necessarily like rap was on the the extra fly thing, like like yeah. it, you know it had evolved. So you was in 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 a lot of ways ahead of your time. Where does that whole fashion sensibility come from? Two two things. One, one, um, I believe in first impressions and order of appearances. That is a very in business, in life, and everything. I believe in that, and. The impression in 1989 and before that, the impression of a rapper was literally everything rappers become now. And the impression of a rapper was you're a drug dealer, you are without, and you're pretty much a menace. And I'm saying that because us in New York and we're just in our culture, we're in our culture. But when we step outside of our culture boundaries, you know what I'm saying? We walk down Fifth Avenue, or we walk down Madison Avenue, or or I'm in a random mall in Houston, Texas, in like Pearland, Texas, you know, the like white area of Texas, or yep. somewhere, or or Orange County or Beverly Hills in 1989. I am a menace. I am the worst thing on the planet. And my tool of trade is either selling drugs or rapping. And, and like I said, nowadays, that's what it is. And, and it's a, it's a badge of honor to be that. But when I was growing up, we were taught to not be that and to be better than what 
others may think of you. So the whole suit representation for me was we can rock this too. And, and we don't have to be, first of all, think about this. People got to really realize in 1989, Mm -hmm. athletes, Hated rappers. Yep. Michael Jordan would never, never stand next to a rapper. But we rocking his Jordans every every day. Never. R and B artists hated rappers. Pop artists hated rappers. Radio stations hated, hated rappers. Rapper. Yep. Everybody hated us. So. We it was our job to show the the different facets of black people. Yeah, you had your gutter rappers, you had your hippie rappers like De La Soul, you had like your fun and happy rappers like Kid and Play, and then you know you had your nerd weirdos like me, and we were showing we had your radical rappers like like um, Public Enemy, and we were showing the world that we're not a monolith. We are multifaceted people and hip hop is a multifaceted genre that can come at you from all different angles. Um, You know, brothers from the West Coast bringing their gang culture and showing us what's happening over here. And, you know, and it was it was like that. And so for me, rocking a suit was a representation of that. But also another thing, you know, you know, my, my inspiration, my like clothing inspiration was always people way before me, like jazz musicians and, and even like, you know, everybody wanted to be a gangster, but I'm like, okay, but look how Al Capone and them dressed. They used to dress like this, they, you know, they had the suits and it was, you know, I'm watching movies like Untouchables and, and, yep. and, and I'm like, yo, these dudes is fly. I want to be like that. If we going to be on some gangster stuff, let me at least be like, old 1930s Chicago, New York gangsters, you know, even even the real gangsters running around New York in 1989, the John Gotti's of the world, yeah. they was fly, they didn't come out. You wouldn't, you know, it's funny, like you see movies and you see like the Italian dudes in the like the little chain and the, the velour sweatsuit. Yeah. That wasn't till later. When I was a kid, them dudes was walking around Armani down at all yes. times. Yes. And it was real in New York. Like, you know, people don't understand that gang culture was real. So I'm seeing all that from all angles. I'm like, yeah, I, I want to do that too. And, you know, that's basically what it was. You know, it's so interesting because I, I, I want to keep at the forefront of this conversation. When your first album dropped, you're 16. Yeah. So for you to have this type of awareness, uh, it, it, to me, because I'm thinking, as you're talking, I'm thinking of Sean at 16. Mm-hmm. And I absolutely was not as aware as you were um, yeah. of how we were looked at just as, as human beings. But it, I, I remember with, with my own son, and I would tell him, you know, when he was a teenager, a young man, yeah, you know, you're six foot, one inch tall. You're a black man. This is how the world sees you. Yeah. It has nothing to do with you individually. They don't know that you're a great student. They don't know that you are raised by two parents. They don't know that you have great manners. And you, but they see you. Yeah. With 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 a lifetime of imagery that has been fed to them through media, um, through all of the things that they've seen in their life. So you have to carry yourself different. And, and, I, and I'm listening to you and I'm stunned that at your age, you're saying to yourself, I, I, I'm aware and, and I'm gonna take this upon myself to, to, to show a different side of who we are, not just as rappers, but African American young men. I, I gotta yeah. commend you on that. That's insane. But I gotta I gotta throw that to my parents though, to be honest with you. 
especially my mom. My mom was the first person whenever I would go out as a little kid, just hanging out. You know, back in the days when you kids, they your parents just let you go. And you just you could be out for 10 hours a day and they don't know where you at. But my mother was like, when you are out, you represent me. And you never know who I know. That was her, her thing was, you never know who I know. And when you out in that street, anybody can see you and everybody that knows me knows that you're my kid. Mm -hmm. So don't be out there acting like an ass. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And on the flip side, like whenever I would do, whenever I would go out and my father or my mom's is looking for me, my neighborhood was so close knit. It would be like, like I remember one time I got in so much trouble. I told my pops I was going to get a comic book and this was 930 in the morning. So at three o'clock in the afternoon, <laughs> I'm, driving, I'm riding my bike. <laughs> And every every block that I hit, somebody comes outside. Your pops looking for you. Your pops looking for you. I'm like, shh. That that is old school. That is yeah. so old school. Go ahead. Yo. And and that never left me. So so flash forward to being a rapper. And I remember vividly, I remember in 89 having a cell phone. And um First it was the cell phone with the suitcase. Then it was the big old brick. I right, had huh? this brick. And I remember being back to Texas. I don't know why Texas, but I was in a mall in Texas. And I was on the phone with my mom asking her if she, like, I wanted to pick something up. I think it was like close to Mother's Day or something. And I, don't, I don't know. I was asking her something about Mother's Day. I remember this vividly. And these two white guys were behind me laughing. And it was like, there we go. The local pharmacist, the neighborhood, the neighborhood pharmacist. Crazy. You know, and, and because he they literally saw me see my beeper, make a call. Mind you, I'm in a suit. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm in a suit with a flat top streak in his head, and I'm clearly looking like a 16-year-old kid. I'm not the tallest dude in the in the building. So I'm looking like a kid in a suit with a flat top, with a big old phone, bigger than his head, and a beeper. But their judgment of me yep. never left me. It never left me. And I I could have easily turned around and was like, motherfucker, I make money. Like I don't, I ain't, you know, I'm not that dude. So that made me see that even in a suit, even in, in a suit probably more expensive than anything they have on or anything in Macy's. I am still being judged and prejudged for something that I'm not. Yep. Wow. And it, and it doesn't matter. And it's like, and it, it, and it continued. I've been in other countries, you know, walking in a, a, a store in say London and you know, I'm dressed up. I'm, I'm, I could be wearing, some of the stuff that's sold in the store and you know and and the people not even trying to help me you know or in paris or whatever and i'm seeing this at an early age and i'm seeing things at 16 17 18 19 that most teenagers would never in in queens would never experience you know their experience is going into dr j's their experience is going into in into um the whiz or whatever and you know, getting whatever they're getting, um, Jimmy Jazz, and 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 just getting their stuff, and nobody thinking nothing of it, you know. Or Queen sent them all; they're never going to have that issue. Um, so so, I just understood it. Walking in, I understood it, you know, walking in, and then plus, like I said, my parents, man. I got to give it to him. My father on one end was extremely supportive, artistically supportive, and really, and then both parents really honed in like knowledge of self, like that, that was their thing. And then, you know, I have grandparents also, you know, and I, I, I you know, they say it takes a village. It's the truth, man. It's like, so you, I have my grandparents and I'm lucky enough to have all sets of grandparents and parents. So, and, and all my formative years is a two parent home for grandparent um, situation, even great grandparent situation. And everybody's instilling 
knowledge, and encouragement. And that's why I always tell anybody, yo, encourage your kids. Even if it's stuff that you don't understand. You think my, my parents understood me bringing home a cardboard box and spinning on my ass <laughs> outside? They, they, you know, they didn't get that. Um, they didn't get, they didn't get why I wanted not one turntable, but two, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? They didn't get none of that, but they encouraged it. Um, um, you know, like I give you a perfect example. I'm in the print, say for example, and I'm watching Purple Rain or whatever I'm watching. And my pop's like, you like that guy? And I'm like, yo, he's Prince, man. He does all the music. He said, he said, come with me. So we go to the video store and we get a documentary on James Brown, Little Richard, Jimi Hendrix. He said, now watch all three and then you go, there's Prince. You know what I'm saying? Uh -huh. You know, and I'm sitting there like, yo, yo, yo. And so now um, I'm getting in deeper knowledge. And then to be able to be like 17, 18, and then run into somebody like a little Richard and sit down and say, yo, my pops made me watch da 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 da, da. You know, that to me is just, it's just a dope experience. Doper than any random record experience. The life experiences you get from it, it you know, it just, it just, it shapes you if you allow it to. Because some people don't. Some people go on the road, drink, smoke, smash, and come home. Yeah. And spend the money that they made, and never take in that random experience. They could be in the, they could be in the damn Swiss Alps. <laughs> it's airport, hotel, club bag something back to the hotel back to the airport and you ain't even seen you didn't see nothing in between you didn't get to experience nothing in between because you're so busy wanting a bag like you know it's nah, just your, your sense of awareness and your knowledge yourself it runs the even even as i'm just sitting listening to you because you, you you're dropping these little nuances that go over most people's heads yeah. you know i've been on countless tours and, yeah. and you're right. Tours, they're grueling. Yeah. But they're fun. They could, I, be the, they never, could be the most fun you've ever had in your life if you allow it to be. Yes. Yeah. And and, and especially you're the artist. Like, like I'm in the background. Mm -hmm. so, and I had tons of fun on tour. So I can yeah. only imagine what it's like for being the person who's actually on stage. Yeah. But for you to, to, to be out there and, and, I was the same exact way when I could. Um, I was trying to take in as much as humanly possible and see and learn as much as humanly possible because coming from the Bronx, that's all I knew. Yeah. You know, I, 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 I didn't, I didn't think I would be in some of the countries or, or, or the States that I have ever touched ground in. So to see how people lived and, and how they viewed us, it was it was an eye-opening experience. Yep. So, you know, I'm loving just to hear um your perspective and the things that you learned. I I, I gotta ask you, what do do you remember your first tour? Yes. My first tour, you ever see the movie Straight Out of Compton? Absolutely. That was my first tour. So, you, your first tour was with NWA? My first okay. tour was I, I get, this is so random. Even before you go, where you about to go? I, NWA represented something so completely different than Kwame the Boy Genius. How the hell do you wind up on an NWA tour? Because back then, see, like once '90s hip hop came, the 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 tour scape, it could be clubs. It could be arenas or anything in or theaters, it could be anything in between. When I was out, it was arenas. <laughs> like that's what we did. We walked in at arenas. You know, we definitely had our little hip hop clubs, but when it was time to really like go on tour, it was purely arenas. And that tour was amazing because it was a mix of people. It was Sometimes it was me, kid and play. We were the oddballs. 
NWA, Too Short, DOC, JJ Fast. So Dre had all his people. Mm-hmm. Then we had Digital Underground when Pac was in it. So Pac was with us at, and, and all these runs as well. And we were all around the same age. So, and then on top of that, because they had fucked the police out, every law enforcement agency boycotted the tours and boycotted security. So there was no security. We couldn't check in under our names. We had to use aliases. We had to go to outside cities sometime. Um, no security. And then there was that law of if you curse, if you do any kind of sexual act, if you're in a certain state, you are automatically arrested. So we would have to do recon like easy E would be like, OK, look, tonight. Because it was easy NWA tour, but easy was like, I'm not going to close tonight. What's going to happen is I'm going to go on and then Kwame is going to go on. Or Kid and Play is going to go on. So I'm going to go on. I'm going to say the crazy stuff. Of my last song, Kwame, you run on stage. And I'm running in the audience because the cops are going to be backstage. So easy and finished. We want easy. And then here I come, the rhythm. <laughs> and easy runs into the stage. You know, that's what it was every night. Every night. So that hold on, just so I'm clear, that was his way of avoiding getting arrested. He was going wild out, do what he was going to do, and then yeah. run into the audience where they can't find him. Thirty thousand people just jump in the audience and jet out the front door. Ah! Yep. Oh my goodness, that's a crazy Kwame. Please tell me, please tell me, and this is something I didn't do. Tell me, you got a lot of pictures from back in them days? Nope. No, nope. that's the one area we all messed up on. Like I see random things like. Like I saw this one picture, somebody sent me this picture. It was me. Ice Cube. Maybe Shock G from Digital Underground. And somebody else. And we're at a we're at a desk. Like we were doing homework. I'm like, what the hell is this? And we're all sitting there like we were literally like kids in a classroom. And it was like, nah, that was a meet and greet and y'all doing autograph signing. But we all looked like we were just doing random homework. It was the weirdest picture I've ever seen. Or somebody sent me a video recently. It was, um, we used to play this game called Tornado. And each group will infiltrate (laughs) another group's, um, dressing room or a tour bus and tear it up just tear that shit up and you had to guess who did it so one of my dancers he was the one that was the, i didn't i was i had no time for that but he was the one doing it so i think they went and they did they tore up kid and plays um dressing room and tupac ratted my dancer out so there's a video of Kid and Play Pac bum rushing my dressing room <laughs> and gripping up my dancer. Like things like that. That's the type of stuff we did on the road, man. We were just, we were just out, we were just young having fun, man. It was just pure fun. It was that's that's the best way to describe it. Yeah, y'all, y'all are kids. I know even when you saw that picture, y'all sitting down there signing um autographs. It, it, you gotta look at that and be like, my God. God, we was young. Like, yeah, like, we looked like had, babies, man. We all looked like little kids. What do you remember about Tupac back in them days? Because this is before Pac became Pac. We still well, talk about Pac and Digital Pac, Underground. Pac, Pac was very close because there was a there's a girl in, in my group. Her name was Tasha. And I was dating Tasha. And Pac was dating Yo-Yo. Yo-Yo was on it, too. So... We'd be like the double date kids from from high school. Literally. It was like, hey, we're gonna all go to a restaurant. <laughs> and we'd be 16, 17 up in a restaurant or or just hanging out, or Pac would come to me, man, yo yo playing me, man. And you know, just dating advice. It was that type of vibe. Are and, you serious? Yeah, and or um it was just like um like my memories are more like, you know. 
he was like a super mischievous kid as well. So like him, and I had a dancer named Peekaboo, and him and Peekaboo would always get into trouble. Like I remember one time I had to get them, like I had to bail them out for something that they did. They did something crazy. I don't remember. I don't remember what it was or what state, but it was one thing we had to definitely go to a station and, and get them out. But that's what it was. It was just kids being mischievous, man. Or like we would go, we would have um, I would have BMX bikes, and um, it would be me sometimes Pop couple of us, we would just be like, what city? We're in, I remember we were in Phoenix one day and we just wanted to see the city. We all got on our bikes and bounced. We looked like black kids off the E.T. movie or something like that. Literally that, on not not motorcycle bikes. No, no, BMX bikes. We had bikes <laughs> on the bottom of the tour bus. I bought bikes and I put them on the bottom. And that's what we did. Bikes, skateboards. We had water gun fights. We were kids, man, like pure kids. That's crazy. Okay, so so I, I gotta ask. Um, you you you. They say you can always tell a winner out of right out the starting gate. Um, mm -hmm. You you what you just mentioned legendary MCs. Um, I can't tell a winner. <laughs> you, you so so because I'm about to go. Don't I, ask me if I saw if I thought people would become great. No, <laughs> really. No, nah. but there's a reason for that. I don't know if it's a fault of mine or not. I see, and it sounds corny as shit. I see everybody the same. Like any, even when I work with artists, this I've never, I've worked with big artists. I work with small artists. Everybody is exactly the same to me. Like I don't, I never trip. There's no, there's like my thing is everybody has a shot. And I believe that if you're here, if I'm here with you and you're on this stage and I'm on this stage and whatever, we all are supposed to be here. Period. We're, we're here because we're supposed to be here. Everybody got a shot and nobody and everybody cannot be number one. So we just the same. One of us is going to be number one. One of us is going to be number 10. But we're all going to be in the room at some point in time because we're in the room now. Um, and so, like, I've I've heard great records before it came out, and I'm like, that's all right. Uh, like, you know, I've heard, I've seen great artists before they got big, and I'm like, he's all right. <laughs> you know, it's it's never it's and you can name any of the any of the the biggest people out. I probably have crossed personal paths with them, um, you know, from that era at some point in time. So to me, it's all the same. It's literally all the same to me, man. I can't. So you, I mean, because I know even for me, I've sat in rooms with people and, and it just is something magnetic, something special about this individual. Even if you can't put your finger on it, you're like this person they got that genesis quad. They got that. that, yeah. that <laughs> but in the position that you've been in, have you ever been in a room with somebody that you just couldn't see it at all and they blow the hell up? Yes, absolutely. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. So it's like, there's people, how many times have you seen an artist walk in a room, you know, especially being behind the scenes at a label, you see artists that no one ever, ever sees. They never Correct. come out. Correct. You know what I'm saying? Yo, we just signed so and so. They're gonna blow up. They never come out. Correct. You know what I'm saying? So it's like, how can you determine that? Because determining that, they can't do it by themselves. So you can't never determine somebody catapulting up. It's like saying it's like looking at an astronaut, right? Mm -hmm. And you're looking at a room full of astronauts, like that's the one that's gonna go to Mars. No, he may be the one that's going to go to Mars, but he needs the rocket ship to get to Mars. And you can't predict where the rocket ship is coming from yet, unless you make the rocket ship and you're going to be like, I'm putting him on my rocket ship. That's the only way you can determine if somebody's going to super blow. You can say, 
let me tell you something. So the nicest MCs I've ever witnessed in my life have never made a record. Like the greatest rappers I've ever heard in my life have never made records. And then there's some great ones that have. Some of the greatest singers I've ever known have never made records because you can't get it done. They don't, they, you see them, they have the it factor when you see them, you hear them, they have the it factor when you hear them, you put them in the studio and it flops. <laughs> it just don't yep. happen. Mm -hmm. So I turn my brain off when it comes to that, man. I can't even, I can't call it and I won't call it. I just don't have that gift. I think other people have that gift. I personally do not have that gift to call a superstar because I know way too many superstars before they were superstars, like personally, way too many. And I could have never figured that out. From did, did anybody ever surprise you then? Everybody. <laughs> <laughs> everybody surprises me. Everybody, you know, from Jay-Z to whoever, everybody, do I think hanging out with Puff in a dorm room with chicks, do I think, oh, he's going to be a billionaire music mogul. He's going to be our answer to Barry Gordy. You think I'm thinking that? That's so I'm real. I'm thinking about that chick in the next room. I'm just... <laughs> And he thinking about the chick in his room. You know what I'm saying? That's what we thinking about. You know, I'm not, I'm not, cause we don't, and I guess it's because we're not having those conversations. It's just general. What do you want to get? What do you want to order? Where are we going to get some pizza from? You know, those are the conversations we're having. And, and, um, you know, and, and, and I'm not, this is not like a, a flex or anything, but for example, my cousin is Vin Diesel, right? Okay, I, I, heard, I heard about that. Is, is that real? Like, is that this is, it's a real thing? He is my cousin. You know, birthday parties, little kids, staying at each other's house the whole nine. He's six years older than me. He's my big cousin. You could never tell me, never in 100 billion years, that that guy, my cousin, was going to be a movie star. I didn't even know he acted. <laughs> like when we were kids, when I was being, when I was starting my thing as a rapper, he wanted to rap, and we were talking about how how I'm going to put him out, and we were coming up with gimmicks. <laughs> there was no point in saying I'm going to be a superstar. There's even when he made he made. Um, Sorry, he made a um, an independent film that went to a film festival, and Steven Spielberg saw it. And I'm sitting up watching Save It Private Ryan. And I'm like, yeah, what the hell? <laughs> Literally, I'm like, yo, I'm calling my mother. I'm like, yo, what's this? <laughs> you know, and and then I ended up, you know, seeing him right after that. I'm sitting with him. I'm like, yo, dude, what the hell? You're an actor now? He said, hey, man, <laughs> Steven Spielberg liked me. I'm like, what? He said, yeah, I'm about to put out another one. What? I can't call it, man. I can't call it. So you're just like, I'm pretty sure people in my family couldn't call it with me. So there you go. That's crazy. That's crazy. And, and, and you know what's so dope about that, that, that story with your cousin? Because that's how everybody feels about they they big cousin, little cousin. Like that's just yeah. such and such. That like like even as you was telling that story, it's so real because you just look at him as that's just my big cousin Ben in the story. Yeah, like 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 we're at a dinner. We were at a dinner like a family dinner because his sister is my age. So sister. Having a birthday. Oh, actually, his niece, my sister's, his sister's daughter was having a birthday. And we all the families all at dinner and we're just talking. And it's just so it's it's like I like I said, 
I don't I don't get it, man. <laughs> I just don't get it. You know, we're, we're just talking regular stuff, but yet is black car, you know, the the you know, the SUV and the guy standing in front of it, he's outside the whatever, it's all this goofy stuff going on outside. But inside it's the same old thing. It's just regular stuff. And I prefer that. You know, yep. to be honest with you, I prefer it. I prefer to be like that. I prefer to be able to sit with artists of all types and the armor comes off. And we just, whether we're just kids again, we're just like minded adults. You know, and that's how I just see see all people just in general, man. It's just like I don't I can't put the the glow on them, man. It's just it's just because you know, that's what you do every other day, man. Like when we hang out, let's you can take the glow off and we can just we can just chop it up and and you know, if we gotta work, we'll get to work. But yeah, I I, I don't know. Because I think when people start seeing people that way, they start acting different, talking different maneuvering different around them and i know from the other side i know that they a lot of them don't like that they're like why is like why is my cousin acting different around me you know what i'm saying or why is my boy that i've known since i was 12 acting different around me now that i'm a rapper or whatever you know and i you know i can say that you know, I can have friends that were like best friends from eighth grade and we all hanging out and they talking, talking like giving me Arsenio Hall interviews. And I'm like, yeah, right. dude, the hell? <laughs> you know, we used to break dance together. You talking to me about have I met Beyonce or somebody? Like, come on, man. <laughs> like, right. chill. So, you know, yeah, that not to be long winded, but yeah, that's that's how I, I just see it. it. I get it hundred percent. You know, and I, and, I, and I'm a, I'm gonna make a a a, a diversion right here because something popped into my head that I don't know if I ever knew the answer to. And but it's a little off topic. Your first album is it, it, it's called Kwame the Boy Genius featuring yeah. a, a new beginning. beginning. Yeah, who the hell's it? Is is that like when R. Kelly came out and he had um? That was me trying to be oh, Prince and the oh, Revolution. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I always wanted to have like, like Morris Day in the Time, Prince in the Revolution, you know. I always wanted to have like a crew that did stuff. So, you know, there was my DJ. Um, then I had like a side guy. His name was A Sharp, and A was like. Beyond a hype man, you know, he was a collaborator in the studio, hype man, um, and he also sang. So, like, if I wanted to have singing hooks, I was going to sing. Then I had Tasha, who also would do singing hooks. Um, and then at one point, it was a beatbox, but he never made the cut when it came to albums. And, and then it was the dancers. But I didn't want, I just wanted everybody to be incorporated and us be seen as a unit, not as an individual. Um, because when you are a unit, you start, you, you, you're, if you're a like-minded unit, this is me in my 16 year old brain. Um, influence, is, it's like almost like a bigger influence. You know, you're coming with your whole crew. You're not, you know, I'm the oddball, I'm the nerd in the bunch. So I'm not, I'd rather show up with, the revenge of the nerds <laughs> then just show up by myself. Um, and that's pretty much how it was, you know, and, and everybody had a purpose until they didn't have a purpose. If, if that makes any kind of sense. Yeah. I always wondered, cause I was like, who the hell is a new beginning, you know, yeah. and you know, to your point, even, even back, you, you can think of, uh, and you know, name so many of them, Morris, Day in the time, uh, Prince of the Revolution. I started to say R. Kelly, and he had public announcement. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Flash had the Furious Five. Yeah. So I, I, I got it. I got it. Um, where'd the polka dots come from? So polka dots. Interesting. It came from being broke. 
<laughs> so I had, I had a white shirt with black dots. And I had a black tie with white dots and black socks with white dots. And then I had this black pants and a black jacket and these black and white shoes. And that was my black and white fly suit. The only suit, the only fly unit, my get up, like that's like my party thing. You know, if it was a function, I'd put on my black and white. You know, that was that was me. So when it was time to make the album cover, on the back of the cover, I had that outfit on. The same photo shoot with the same outfit was my first single cover. It was a single called The Man We All Know and Love. And that was my outfit mm -hmm. for The Man We All Know and Love single. Yep. Then I shot my video. That same outfit minus the black and white shirt was in a scene, the polka dot tie with the socks. And then the black and white polka dot shirt was in another scene as pajamas. Nobody had the sense to put four and four together and say, this is the same outfit being rotated. They're like, this dude wears polka dots all the time. And I'm like, no, but still. So my very first, it's funny, the very first show was well, the second, my second professional show, the day after my first professional show, was in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. And I was opening up for Sweet Tea mm -hmm. and Coach Back. And I get on stage in my suit. I didn't have no polka dots on. I might have had that black and white tie. I didn't put my money into suits yet. <laughs> so I get on stage and all the girls had on polka dot biker shorts and dresses. All the guys had on polka dot shirts, flat tops with the blonde in it. And Herbie and my crew were known for elaborate jokes. So I walk on stage, told them to turn off the music. I looked at everybody. I was like, okay, y'all fucking with me. And I walked off and I bounced. So I ain't getting on stage. Y'all playing games. Y'all trying to have people. Y'all trying to joke on my one shirt. Da, 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 da. I was beefing. And they were like, nah, kid, they here for you. And I'm like, what? And I got on. I was like, did y'all wear that for me? And everybody was like, yeah. And it was like, you know, it was a bunch of kids. And I was like, oh, snap. And then I still didn't believe it. But then every city after city after city after city, same thing. And I'm like, I guess we got to buy some polka dots. <laughs> so you, you never know. wore that outfit to start a trend? No, 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 no. But I understood what was happening. And like I said, I throw it back to Prince. I throw it back to Run DMC. I was like, every big artist has a thing. Yep. Even like Michael Jackson had the slouchy socks and the glove. Madonna had the, remember those, those, um, what was it, the virgin bracelets or whatever Madonna oh, had? Yeah, yeah. You know, all the girls were dressing like that at one point in the 80s. Run DMC had the Kango and the, um, LL had the Kango. Run DMC had the Adidas. Prince had purple. So I was like, yo, I got polka dots. And, and, you know, so I incorporated it. And then I started turning it in. Then I started bugging out. I started turning it into, something else i would be like so like you know especially if a white person would interview me and like so what does the polka dots mean and i'm like the white on my shirt represents the white man's influence on the world but the black polka dots stand out over the white man's influence because these are the black achievements of the black man <laughs> and then i'd be like the black on the shirt represents the 400 years of slavery that we've endured and the white dots represent the white man trying to impose themselves over our culture and our meaning. <laughs> I couldn't, y'all couldn't make this up. 
So I was like, yo, you want to make it a thing? I'm going to make it a thing. Whatever. What you, what you want to do? <laughs> like, come on. Yo, that's insane. I, I remember everybody rocking them polka dots. Like, everybody rocking the polka dots. And, and, and also, I mean, you was a trendsetter as well with, with, the, with the high top fade, with the, what was that, the, like the, 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 the blonde streak through it at that time? Yep. So you, you were setting a lot of trends. Um, you know something else that, that surprised me about you as an artist? And it wasn't as common as it is today. Your, your first album came out in 89. And you literally yeah. dropped the second album in 90. Nobody back in them days were dropping albums a year apart, 12 months apart, 15 months apart. It nope. just wasn't done. What, nope. what, what made you, number one, uh, get back in the studio so quick? Because usually when you blow, as you know. Because because Prince dropped the album every year and I'm going to do the same thing. That, literally. Literally. Because Prince and Stevie Wonder was able to drop one to two albums a year, and you ain't gonna stop me from doing the same thing. No more, no less. No more, no less. I stayed in the studio. Like after the first album, I would, you know, shoot a video, shoot, you know, we shot like four videos the first album, but I brought my equipment on the road. And that was the cool thing about being on the NWA tour like seeing Dr. Dre, that's what Dre would do. Yep. Equipment was on the road. Like Dre would have his stuff like, yo, check this beat out. And I'd be like, yo, check this beat out. You know, that's how we were. Um, so, so, um, yeah, that's, that wasn't nothing to me. It was like, you know, I'd rather be in the studio than out of the studio. You know, may, may, I credit. And I wanted to get my advance quick enough. <laughs> But again, I got to give it to you because at that age, um, and I've been, again, you've been on tour just like I have. Yep. Uh, to, to get artists to focus on tour, because, because you're performing at night, you're up early in the morning, you're probably doing a press run, you're probably doing morning radio, you're doing something that's keeping you busy. Yes. And one of the areas that I always see artists struggling is while they're on the road, you got to find time to do the thing that made you pop in the first place, which is, right, get in the studio and record. Yep. And most artists can't do that consistently because they they're focused on girls, they're getting high, they, they, they are having the time of their life. So again, you're such a young man to be able to... to have the presence of mind. I'm taking my equipment on the road with me. Yeah. And I'm literally, as we are driving state to state, I'm making beats. That, that, that's just not the way it is done commonly. It, it's just not. Well, and, and to have enough music to put out an album one year later. I think, I think it's, a, it's, it's, it's a mixture of a lot of things. And you touched on it. One, I don't drink and I don't smoke. Never have. Um, Chasing chicks, yes, that was a, the worst. I was the worst at that, meaning that's all I did. Um, and But I think being on the road is the best thing that can happen to an artist and the worst thing. So the best thing is you're being exposed to forms of music that you may not ever be exposed to at home and you may make music a little bit different because of that because especially a new york rapper in 1989 it's all about new york and no other place in the world should ever try to do hip-hop because it's all about new york so when you start going down south you start going to the midwest start going to the west coast and you hear this other hip-hop you may hate it but you got to understand that you know what maybe these beats need to be a little bit slower next time Maybe I need to chop my wordplay up a little bit next time because I'm exposed. I'm seeing what other people like. They like what I'm doing, but they like what Too Short is doing way more than what I'm doing. And you know what I'm saying? So it's like, 
okay, I'm not going to ever be too short. I'm not going to be cube, but maybe I can learn something from this. Where a lot of New York rappers are like, get that out of here. Like, I ain't, I ain't listening to that. So you have that factor. So that's some of the good things that can happen. But like you said, you're now exposed to drug life that you could have never been exposed to before as a kid. No, another at home. level. On another level. You don't have the money for it. So now people are pushing things on you. Um, and it's 420, so you might as well talk about <laughs> So um, <laughs> people are pushing these things on you. Accelerated sex life. You know what I'm saying? A man on the road will have more sex in a week than some men in a lifetime. Understand That's that. People do not understand this. This is the truth. Nobody want to talk about it. It is a 100% truth. More sex in a week than in a lifetime. Some tours are only two weeks long. Some tours are a month. So imagine you, you, you multiply that by four or eight. You have more sex than every man in your family did. <laughs> ever so you're exposed to a hyper hypersexuality which now exposes you to disease possibly also exposes you to and there's too many rappers that can you can name to multiple children yeah yeah that you would have never had if you would have just focused on your stuff or not been a rapper or in the music industry. And so now, if you're not mentally prepared for that, you're never going to get back in the studio and because your mind ain't even there. Your mind is on a hundred other things. And, and people, places, and things are pulling you in 200 directions and you can't focus on that. Um, and I think for me, I focused on what I was supposed to focus on, but I just think that um, time, music, and vibes were just changing at the same time. So for me, I'm focusing on this while everything is doing this over there. So sometimes things didn't add up. But my focus was always, always there, minus girls. But I always knew how to compartmentalize my chase. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, just meet me at the studio. And <laughs> so you, you got to sit there and watch me work. <laughs> um, um, but, or just dating talented girls. And I'm going to put you to work. Come sing. <laughs> Things like that. You know, um, it, that was more like more of my thing, you know, it was, but I watched, I did watch a lot of rappers not be able, some rappers, some rappers got so big that they could cut through all of that. You know, you can just be extra large and things just fall in your lap and you're able to do studio time and drink time and smoke time all at the same time. Um, but then some rappers just couldn't, couldn't cut it. You know, and then now, real life, real life kicks in. I know a lot of artists, um, the downfall of their careers was the road. I mean, they just had too much fun on the road. They got distracted, but I always put myself in the place of an artist. It, to have that level of discipline, um, you, 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 you're, you're performing at night, then you're in the after party. You're doing that to two, three, four in the morning. You gotta get up, you gotta do morning radio. You got to get back on the bus or, or you're heading to an airport and you're taking a plane, you touch down three hours later, two hours later, however long the flight is. Yep. It is, and it's a cycle. It's every day. Where yep. do you find time to be creative? And if you are overindulging on all of the things that come with that life, it could really jam you up. Well, and you never get back to it. Creativity presents itself in all things. So the, the real creative person, even through all of that, sees the creativity in that. And the experience they go through is what they write about. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? 
So it's like, you know, something happened at the club that night. Oh, this is a whole story. You know, um, something happened with this girl. Oh, this is a whole record. Something happened in between this thing and that thing. You know, that's a song. You know, that between that and I, I call it escape velocity. When an artist reaches escape velocity, meaning they're in the stratosphere, they're like superstar status. It starts to level out because the bigger you become, the less time you have to play around. You don't have you don't have the luxury to hang out anymore. You don't have the luxury to do all the extra things you did when you were coming up. So now everything is a schedule. Radio, yep. studio, show, flight. There's no in-between things to mess up if you get to that high, 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 high level. You know, it's everybody in the in-between parts trying to get to that high level that it's like a video game, man. It's all just obstacles that try to stop you from getting to that escape velocity level and and continue it. For, for real. Yeah, it's That's not an easy think. life at all. It's not an no. easy life. Um, you know, I once I once heard your second album, your lead single, Only You. Yeah. Um, was that originally written for Vanessa Williams? Yeah, I wanted her to be my sugar mama. So <laughs> I was gonna write a song for her and I was gonna... <laughs> Like, like the, the actual song itself, not her feet. Yeah, man, I was trying to bag Vanessa Williams. Don't get it twisted. <laughs> <laughs> I was 17, 18. I thought I could bag Vanessa Williams. And I was like, I'm going to write her this song. <laughs> <laughs> and and um, I knew, no, I heard, I heard that really, I heard that she was looking for like a more of a hip hop type of record. And so when she had that record, The Right Stuff, um mm -hmm. and, and uh some other records she had but um you know i wanted to make a record where i was the feature so i wrote and produced only you and then put like me on it as a feature and they turned it down so then i was like yo but this record is dope and so um i just turned it into a record for me but but more importantly when i made that record i think the best thing that I've done and the worst thing that I've ever done as an artist was I've cared more about experimenting than actually focusing on landing the single or the project. Like that was never important to me. I was always about the experiment. So for me, Only You, when I was making Only You, radio stations across the country had this thing called the No Rap Workday from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m., they were not going to play rap. They had oh. commercials saying no rap crap, no rap work day. We want you to have a good day at work. We're not gonna bombard your ears with anything rap. That was a known power move in yeah. radio in 1989, 1990. So I was like, all right, cool. I'm gonna make a 50% R&B record, 50% hip hop, 100% dance record. And I asked Sylvia because Syl because at that point Atlantic was pushing all rap records with a label on it, it said Atlantic Street. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I took offense to that. It was like some African dancer like logo and it said I Atlantic Street well. it had a big six sticker on it. And I took I was I was offended. I was like, why are you separating us from that? Why are you separating Kwame and MC Light and DOC from the vert? What's up with that? Well, you know, you know what? That means when you hand the, 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 the 12 inch to the program director, they're not going to play it because you put that sticker on it. Yo, I'm telling you, I was hot. <laughs> why are you making such a big deal? And and I was able to, you know, me and Sylvia had that rapport, like, yo, I'm telling you, this is not dope. This ain't dope. And they were like, well, well, this is what we're doing. I was like, well, do me a favor. Do not service only you with the sticker. I, I beg you, just don't. For shits and giggles, take the sticker off. See what happens. And at 
five in the morning, six in the morning, that record was getting played. And that record, that record did great. Like yeah. globally, um, um, nationwide, the record did great. And it was like some, I told you, but they still kept, you know, the next records that have the damn sticker on it. But, um, you know, and you know how it is. Ex- execs sometimes don't want to be proven wrong. They, you know, they they have their vision and they want you to respect their vision. And I get it. Um, but that sticker was the worst. And then Sylvia left, like dead in the middle of the project. She went into um, to East West, which turned into Electra. So, so that ally to keep the stickers off <laughs> wasn't there anymore. <laughs> so we're like. Uh... You know, we talk about Sylvia Rome. Can you believe this woman is still actively working at a high level in the music industry? Like we, we that we talk- I can believe. You can believe it. That I saw. Yeah, Sylvia was so, and I'm not gonna call her. When 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 I was young, she everybody felt old. Like like yeah. Sylvia was a grown woman when I was young. Like like yeah. most people don't retire in the music industry. They just don't. Sylvia has been around for a long freaking time at a yep. very, very high level. Yep, so always. You, you, you said earlier, Sean, I can't call it. I, actually, I see everybody the same. Now you're saying, I saw that. What was it about because, Sylvia? Because what Sylvia, it's funny. My, I, had a, I had a godfather who used to go on the road with me, and um, he used to run he used to run um, clubs in New York. And one time I brought him up to Atlantic and Sylvia comes out, she sees my godfather. She's like, hi, Kenny. <laughs> and my godfather was like, hi, Sylvia. I'm like, you know, y'all know each other. And, and my godfather was like, yo, she used to be the receptionist here. Yep, yep. For real? He's like, yeah. And I said, she runs the joint. And, and, and he was like, yeah. Like he would tell me like knowing her, she was an upwardly mobile like thinker like she went to business school she was like she was about her game and and over the years even not being at atlantic and keeping in touch with her and and just or keeping in touch with um people that were around you know just seeing that seeing that progression it was a constant progression so no at 16 did i say oh you're going to be the president of the world no i didn't i didn't think that but it's a consistent move. You know, she's made consistent moves. So by the third move, you're like, all right. You know, when you see somebody make consistent moves and peers fall as mm-hmm. you're making your consistent move and you see the peers fall fall to the wayside or just do other other things, um you start to you start to understand, especially becoming older and see, having a business mining or, or or just having a business appreciation, um, you start to see it. Um, and it goes to show something for the black community, the black music community. We see all of our executives at every state of their executive maneuvers. We run into them, we keep in touch with them. If they're not in a label position, they tend to be in other positions or other facets of this industry where we can still keep in touch in some way, shape or form. But I don't see that with the white, the white industry heads. So there are certain, so, so back to Sylvia, like if, if Clive Davis can stick around, if, um, um, what's my man at Universal? That went to Sony. Um, why am I drawing a blank? And I'm drawing a blank is right with you. Top dog of all top dogs. We're not, I- we're not. We're not. We're not talking currently. We're not talking about um Tommy do Matola. Are we? No. 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 I'm talking um up until very recent. Um, what's what homeboy's got? name? Ballhead. Um, I'm head of Universal for a long time. Um, I forget it. It'll come to me. But I see these executives 
uh, Lucian Grange. I see these people, uh, Jimmy Iovine, moving up and staying up, you know? And I'm like, when I see Sylvia, I'm like, okay, one of us is doing it too. They do it all the time. So it's not going to be a surprise to see one of us do it. Um, and, you know, that's where it is. It just so happens that the one of us that I see doing it is somebody that I personally knew um, that started me out. Um, yeah, but, the, you know, I just looked at it like that. I was, you know, it was like, why can't, you know, some people will just straight disappear. You don't know, you know, you don't, you don't know where they went. Like, like, for example, like, uh, say, a Donnie, Donnie Einer that was at um, um, Sony. When he left Sony, he became a CEO of somewhere else. That had nothing to do with music, you know, because that's what they go to school for. That's what their, you know, their business mind goes. Like, you know, uh, um, um, Bartles um, over that was at... Um, Bartles? Yeah, at, at, at Def Jam. I don't know where he went, you know. I don't know. See, he was a good friend too. Um, yeah, Bartles was was. I wonder where the hell is he these days. Yeah, like, but but um, trust me, they're at another place. Correct. Running something, you know, because right. that's what they do. Um, so why, you know, I'm 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 like, why can't why can't we, you know? Um, and so that definitely brings me to a Sylvia, and you know, there's other people, you know, like a Clarence Avon, and there was um. You know, just just so many other people that you see just still running things in their own way, and 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 um, I appreciate seeing that. I especially appreciate seeing that in our community. It doesn't have to be the particular job we knew them for, but to see them them still thriving in a certain situation um, is very dope. And I'm really proud to see that Sylvia has been doing it. So am I. So yeah, am I. I was a little kid, you know. I think I, I want to say when I first met Sylvia, to be honest with you, she was probably 35 years old. You know what I'm saying? She was definitely 30 something. I remember her telling me, I'm 30. And I'm like, oh, you old. <laughs> I remember that. Like, I remember you, you know, kid, but when you're a kid, somebody who was even says 30, that, that's yeah. old. I remember saying like 35 or 38. I remember one of those numbers or both. And me in my mind going like, yo, she's so old, man. Like, I, you know, but and also back then, A&R guys were different. They were older. They were in their, well, my, to me, they were in their 30s. They came to work in suits. Yep. You know, they were in between their thirties and their fifties. So to a sixteen year old? Correct. Correct. That's old, that's older than my pops. You know Correct. what I'm saying? My pops is old to me. You know, so to a sixteen year old, I'm seeing somebody that's fifty, that's an A and R. I'm like, what does this guy know? And that's why a lot of rappers used to beef about their A and R's not knowing the music. And 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 they had a valid point. They yeah. did. Because uh, many in Man, you bringing me back. Um, that is that is that was the uniform of A and R's. They would literally come in in suits. Yeah, and you you are a young kid from the inner city. Yeah, and you dress in the way we dress, and you in the studio with a dude who looked like number one. I don't get the music. Number two, I I, I don't even like this type music. Yeah, so it was a it was a crazy. Yeah, very, very different world. Yo, let me tell you, I remember one time someone in the in, in, in my Atlanta career, I was approached to possibly be an A&R. And before I said yes or no, the first thing I said is, I ain't wearing no suit. That was the first thing. I was like, yo, man, I'm not coming to work. I already wear suits like the way I, but you got me wearing men's warehouse suits to work nah man i was not with it <laughs> you know you know you just brought something up i didn't even think about what why didn't you ever become a label exec because you uh, you 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 were the the prototype for 
where the music industry has evolved to. Mm -hmm. So many artists, producers, people who uh, have the ability to either recognize talent, produce talent, they have turned in their, yeah, yeah. their artist caps and, and, and put on that label exec hat. Why, why didn't you ever do that? I think, I think um, to my own detriment, I would I can safely say that as an artist, you know, I'm I'm free. I I work for myself. I, you know, I make as a producer, I make money. I go on the road still. I I'm able to keep a home and and a family and cool things, and I'm free. Part of me starts to think, and I'm and I'm not saying this is a smart part of me, mind you. <laughs> I'm willing to admit the dumb parts of me too. So part of me thinks, yo, I can't be in no office every day looking at artists in their face and telling them one thing when I know in the back of my mind it could possibly be something else. Um, crunching numbers. And then I think the like the worst thing, like I'm a pessimist at nature sometimes. I'm like, what happens if it comes to that day when they send the two security guards to the office and they tell you you can get we'll bring your stuff down? Oh man, I'm gonna be so embarrassed. Yo, that is the yo, corporate, that's the worst thing corporations do. You could be the best worker, and then the goons show up to your office one day and be like, <laughs> We'll get your stuff. Or you can come back on Saturday. We're escorting you out. Leave your <laughs> Leave your laptop, leave your phone. You'd be like, what? <laughs> you can pack you your know. plaques up on Saturday morning. You'd be like, they don't even give you a heads up. You, you no, they don't tell you, you nothing. No. They show up. Security guy shows up and HR shows up and they're like, yo, you got to go. Can you? No, HR calls you to the room and a security dude goes to your office and starts. <laughs> You could be president of the company. Yo, man, I, I can't do it, man. I nah, but you you really, you really could have, like, with all that you've done, yeah. you were groomed for that position, whether you wanted it or not. And, and I'm so surprised. And, and even hearing the reason why you didn't go that direction is... Well, I was never I was never offered that position either. Like I think I think um I don't know. I don't know how others in higher positions may see me, but I think my personal thought is I think they see me as too too artsy to get into business mode. Mm. Um and it's probably the truth. You know, you know, I've been in you know, one of the biggest, the biggest answers, I tell people this all the time, the, the biggest question you'll ever be asked in business is the shortest question. And that is, what do you want? Correct. You sit in front of somebody that has the power, they're going to ask you, and it happens every time, and I'm pretty sure you've seen it. What do you want? Now, my answer... <laughs> is something stupid like not even getting the question oh no i'll take a i'll do a, a turkey burger <laughs> or something like that you gotta be kidding me and look at jimmy Iveen's face what <laughs> and now what do you mean you know and then it turns into the awkward moment you know what i'm saying sometimes i can be so spaced out that I probably have missed opportunities like that. You know what I'm saying? And and I've not known that the opportunity was even there because I'm so I'm a daydreamer by nature. So I'm I'm looking at the studio, I'm looking at the office, I'm gathering information, and I'm not smart enough to answer what do you want? Because I should have walked in with what do I want? I'm right. thinking I'm going in there playing beats. But if you 
if you're not asking me to play beats and you're asking me what do I want, that means you want me for something. And I yeah. was not smart enough to understand that question. And that question may never get posed to me again. And I understand that. that's cool. Maybe I'm the one to now ask somebody that question. But but um, that's just, a, I guess, in another universe, man, I, I could be an executive with a, a, a black card. You know, running up charges for Universal. <laughs> You know, nah, I mean, that is the model, like like so many talented producers, so many talented artists, they, they have transitioned. They change yeah. the habit. Yeah, yeah, like that. that is the model. If, if, if you can make talent. Come make it for us. You know, um, one of the one of the one of the executives that I really looked up to was his executive at um, Geffen, Ron Fair and yeah. Ron, whenever I worked with Ron, he put he put it in my mind that I could be an executive too. Um and and because Ron never took an office, all Ron's calls were re rerouted to the record plant in his in his room, and he stayed working. You know, you know, whether he was producing something or doing string arrangements or doing whatever, he never stopped doing that. And then I used to see like other rappers that became like, like there was a time in the nineties where rappers were becoming A and R. Yes. For like two weeks. And I'd be like, they ain't do nothing. They took this job and, and I don't see no result. Like, what? okay, now you the head of A and R, you the A and R at this label, but next year you back on the road being a rapper. So I always just thought like maybe maybe you are you can be just too creative for the job and the fear of doing the job poorly pushes you away from even accepting or receiving the low key offers for the job if that makes any sense. No, it, may, it makes plenty of sense, but um you know, even me listening to you speak uh, you, you, you definitely seem like you might have overthought some of these um, opportunities, you know. Yeah, yeah, no, no, you know, I, I don't, you know, I, I think about it now, like I don't know. Do A and R's even do their job anymore? Like real, real talk. No, I got no because one of my best friends is an A and R. What you and me know A and R to 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 have been, that's yeah. not what A and R's are anymore. At best, A and R's are um, they do administrative work. It's A and R admin. That's what they are. The, the artists are getting their own beats. They're getting it. They're sourcing them from from YouTube and oh, anyway. Yeah, you gotta you just do the ad admin work. You show up to the party. You show up to the the, the the Tuesday meeting. No, the the artist development, the creativity, the, the, the at best you are A and R admin. You're booking studio time and you're waiting for them to to hand you the finished product. And you and here's the crazy thing about today, you damn near can't even give them direction on. Okay, go back and fix that. Go redo these vocals. We're gonna change this beat, this snare. It doesn't work like that these days. No, so it is. What it, you get what you get. It is what it is. And nine no. times also, A and R is like a glorified talent scout. You know, they find what's on TikTok, Instagram, whatever, and they they seek the artists out, and they you know, but like a talent agent, you know, you go in and 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 but but you're you're seeking the package, and then the good A and R seeks the package, gets the package, and then says. How can we make this a bigger package? And you know, and then that's when you start pulling in, you know. Yeah, but that that doesn't exist anymore. I'm telling you, it's a different. Well, maybe with features, I don't know about maybe music. With the features. Yeah, yeah. Like I know so and so's manager. I'm gonna call him. Maybe see if we can. Or I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna get the PO for the hundred stacks for this feature. You know, like whatever whatever the thing is. Um. So yeah, I. I don't know if I could do that. I don't know. I don't know. It, it would just, it would be the easy, I don't know if it's a hard job c compared to 
old school. No, I, I think I think a person like yourself who's such a creative, it, it, it would not be a fulfilling job. Um, you know, somebody who's yeah. used to sitting down, developing talent, uh, sitting next to talent, helping them write, producing for them. Like that, I don't know that that you probably would enjoy where it is today. What I well, what I would do. What I would do if I was in that position, I would provide a safe environment for them to be creative. Meaning, all right, wherever you're at, if you want to get away from all of that, my office is the studio. You're on this label, you have full access whatever YouTube beats, whatever, whatever. And I think you could, by osmosis, give that A&R direction because you're, they are in your space creating. Instead of you waiting for something, it's already there. And you could be like, eh, I don't know about that. <laughs> and you just, yeah, yeah. And, and you know, I think that's the only way that I would, I would definitely want to provide the label, and the artist with a space to be creative at a space, a space with, and, and I'm talking about a full creative space. So I don't know if that turns you into a consultant or not, but I'm talking when I say full creative space, like, okay, you can record here. Do um, you want to come up with some merch? We got a design team over here. You want to figure out your show? This place, you know, right here in the back, we got a full, Thing. you can just you can figure it all out here if you need this you understand i think i think that is what labels are lacking and i know artists want you know at the end of the day even with today's music an artist still wants to be an artist an artist still wants to feel like you know you could be i'm just throwing random stuff you could be a new york drill rapper with beef and you now at the studio all your guys are smoked out you're smoked but in the back of your mind somebody can run up in the studio right kids are going through that kids mind you let's 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 be serious kids are dealing with that right now being artists why not provide a space like yeah you ain't got to deal with that over here just come out here i got you deal with it here you know finish your stuff here you know like there's been times you know like you know there's been artists where they've just had personal problems and personal issues and me and the artist got along and then the a and would say yo can you and so and so get a crib in Miami for the next month and finish this album because in New York is just not getting done. Y'all cool. Y'all have these random conversations, blah, blah, blah. You can be cool together in a house or go to circle house or whatever and be away from the influence. Um, I don't know. I don't know how much that's getting done now, but it yeah, should. No. Some of this stuff should, because I think, some artists would not be in half of the crap they're in if someone provided even just the notion of a safe space. Like, yo, man, you know, whatever. You know, you don't want to be in Atlanta for the weekend. Come here. Yeah. Got you. Yeah. We'll fly you out, you know, just for the weekend. See how much you get done. And, you nah, know, so I, I think it's needed. I, yeah. I, think, I think it's needed. Um, you know, I, I got I to gotta ask you this. And, I'm sure you've been asked this before. Yeah. And this is this is uh getting getting back to your music career. Yeah. Where, where was you? We spoke about Puff earlier mm -hmm. in the conversation. Friend of yours, you watched his career. Intern, going to to president of Uptown Records, starting his own label. Yeah. Where were you the first time that you heard Notorious B.I.G.? Unbelievable. And that famous quote, your I was mom's about, out. Go, go ahead. I was in my living room. Somebody sent it to me. Somebody. So it wasn't on the radio? 
No, no, no. I heard it way before that. Somebody sent it to me. And then remember, were you there when they did the Big Mac thing? Absolutely. Yeah. So I got that. That's, mind you, one of the greatest promotional items I've ever seen. Insane. In my life. So, you know, you had the big, the, 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 the buns and the fake lettuce, yeah. and then the tape was in the middle. So it was on the tape. I still have it. I have all that. So I still have that. Um, and um, so I heard an unmixed version. Then I heard the record version. Um, yeah, it was, that's, that's when I heard it. So, um, but you, let me ask you a question. So mm -hmm. you, you being up there, you just knowing my stuff or whatever, what did you think when you heard it? Okay, I'm an intern at this time, mind you. Mm -hmm. I'm bottom of the barrel. Um, I don't know that I keyed in on that verse in particular. I just thought the song Unbelievable was amazing. Yeah. And that was one of those quotables. Yeah. And to see where that line, that record, that verse had gone. I thought, and, and you're talking to somebody who I still put to this minute, to this hour, big is in my top three. Yeah. MCs of all time. Yeah. If not number one, um, Jay-Z probably took his spot. Maybe he, Jay is one, big is two for me. Yeah. I just thought it was one of the hardest lyrics. I'm like, yo, this dude is amazing. I, 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 I was so, um, it's one thing to work around great talent like that. Mm -hmm. I, I thought bar for bar, this dude was just amazing, and that was just one more lyric in the song. Yeah, I just thought I thought um, I thought the song was. I still think the song is dope. I don't, you know, just as an MC, I just you know I thought, you know, dude is super nice. I think, and I thought that, you know, the album was full of those type of quotables. You know what I'm saying? Oh, um, yeah. You know, so for me, I didn't take it anywhere further than that. Um, I think that, um, I think other people may have just, you know, just outsiders looking in. But for me, it was just like, you know, I saw the missile coming, <laughs> saw the missile coming before it was even launched. So, so um, yeah. Okay, so so I gotta ask you: did, did you ever have a chance to to either sit with Big, bump into him in the club, um, or even Puff for that matter, and have a conversation? I never talked to Puff about it. No, I think Puff Puff came to me. I don't know what club we were in. Puff said something to me about it, but it was like some random. It wasn't. I can't even remember. Um. But with big, like I said, people tried to make it more than what it was to me. When you and, say that, what do you mean exactly? So, for example, you know, it it became the the. So, what are you gonna say to big? What, what about big? What you gonna do about it? And it's like, all right, yo, dude, there's a line. Um, it's not a record. It's a it's a damn line. And at that time, I was on a downswing. You know, right. I didn't have I didn't have a deal. You know, it wasn't like you can make a response and put it on the radio in the next minute. You know what I'm saying? I didn't have those resources. So, so um, by nature, I'm just a jokey kind of guy. So anytime somebody would ask me about it, I would crack a joke. I don't know what the jokes were, but I'm cracking jokes. I'm just I'm making light of the subject. Um, and and I remember one time we were in a club. And I, I did have a record out. It was coming out at the time. And I was in a club. It was, um, what was that club? Mad Wednesdays. Oh, Maria, Maria, Maria Davis. Davis. Yeah, Maria yeah, so, Davis. So we were all in there. And I just remember it being like Maria and some other people were just trying to make it bigger than what it was and it got on the mic like big you in here Kwame, you in here y'all need to settle it right now y'all need to get this thing over with blah 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 and i'm like settle what 
That sound like Maria, boy. Look you know, and I'm like, you know, and then, and <laughs> here come Biggie. So he comes up to me rolling the biggest blunt I've ever seen in my life. Look like a microphone. <laughs> just, and he was like, yeah, I heard him, heard him fucking joke. She was cracking on me. And I'm, and I'm sitting there, I'm still joking. I'm like, what you expect me to do? Blah, blah, blah. And, and if anybody could understand like the size ratio, it's like Spider-Man versus the Hulk. Exactly. Incredible so, Hulk for somebody. Yeah. So like, he's a thousand times bigger than me. And it's so funny because I had two dudes with me, right? And Big had like C's and he had a crew with him. I only had two dudes. And we were in suits, <laughs> back to the suits. And I know like me and him, were, me and Big were trading words, we weren't necessarily beefing, but we were just going back and forth. And I saw his guys coming, right? And mind you, I knew half of them because I, I, I'd, I'd spent a lot of time in his area of Brooklyn. So I knew a lot of, a lot of people. So it was no, like I wasn't, I wasn't feeling a threat or anything. But the funny thing was, as me and this guy's talking, I turn around and the two dudes would be doing the moonwalk out the, out the back. <laughs> I'm like, I told, I was saying the big, like, hold on, hold on. And I turned around, y'all punk ass. Like, you know what I'm saying? It wasn't even that kind of situation, but that was the only, the only, um, and then on top of that, Maria thinks that we are physically beefing and then kicks us out. I'm like, you kick us out from a situation. Kick, out? kick both, both groups? Yeah, it kicked us out. They made me leave through the back. They made him leave through the front. And we both sitting there like, yo, what, what just happened? So that was the only, that was the only anything. You know what I'm saying? It was, you know, but to this day, like all surrounding parties, I'm like super cool with. It's never, it was never no. You want to know something? You, you asked me earlier, what did I think? And, and I don't know that I understood where you were going, but hearing this story, I'm going to tell you, and, and I'm going to tell you, number one, is somebody who was there, number two, as a hip hop, I never took it as a diss track or, yeah, or yeah. shot. I took it as a dope lyric. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I didn't realize that being in your skin, living life and seeing life through your vernacular, people were coming at you like, y'all got beef. Yeah, yeah, no, treat, people literally treated it like we had, we had like, like a pure issue. And I'm like, I don't even like, for example, just to show you how deep everybody goes. Gooch, Mark Pitts, right? Mm -hmm. My right hand man, Al and Mark are classmates from the fifth grade. So I know Mark from since I'm like 14, <laughs> I know Puff since I'm like 17. You know what I'm saying? These are two direct connections. You know, of course I know Mr. C, you know, and other just random parties around. So it's like, there's no beef. I know Clark Kent, there's no beef. These are people that I personally know. And it's probably one of them that sent me the tape. You know what I'm saying? Now I think about it, it wasn't like, I can't remember who sent me the tape. But so for me, I'm like, everything is gravy. I mean, it's just, it's just a line. But I think Biggie ushered in a new era of hip hop. And that new era did not coincide with the era I was from. You understand? Two different mm. things. 
It didn't coincide. So anybody attaching themselves to the new era takes those lines as gospel. And when they see anybody based on those lines, they take it as gospel. You played out because he said you played out. You know what I'm saying? And, and you know, um, it is that, you know, it is what it is on that thing. It's like, I'm not hurt over it or anything like that, but it's, it's, that's, that's we, the, talking, the truth of the matter is it's 1994, 1995. When that yeah. record dropped, you clearly were, were without a deal on the downslope of, of your rap career. Hasn't yes necessarily blossomed to where you went on the production side. Yeah. yeah. You know, huge hits that you produce for artists. So I, you know, it's it's so interesting because I'm telling you, I never looked at it as anything more than another hot bar. Because you because you and and, and I think the only reason why I'm I usually don't even try to address it anymore because it's like 30 years ago. But I'm addressing it with you because you were there. Um, but you got to think of the random kid in Newark or the random kid in Bed-Stuy or the random kid in, in Connecticut or whatever it is. Um, they don't see it that way. They see it as a declaration. Like, I'll give you another example. Not even me. It was when... G Unit versus Ja Rule, right? Mm -hmm. And I remember doing this. That's beef, by the way. Yeah, but no, that's that's beef. But the random kid can't understand that beef, right? So picture this: we're doing a. Um, I was a part of this organization, like this kids empowerment organization. And this is like the height of G Unit and the height of Ja Rule. And um, we do this high school in Union, New Jersey. And Ja Rule is the guest speaker. And he comes to the school and to talk to kids and uplift the kids and, you know, be a celebrity guest. The kids take it that because 50 Cent is 50 is the hot dude now they all organize and every kid puts on a g unit t-shirt so when ja rule shows up mm. all he sees is g unit and he pulls up in a mayback all the kids just throwing snowballs at the mayback he goes into the high school he's still being a trooper about it mind you I saw the kids before he showed up and they were excited to see him. But the mandate was, nah, it's G unit. So he throws on, they all throw on these t-shirts and all the kids that are in the assembly, he gets on stage and they're like, G -G -G -Unit. you know, and the principal has to come outside, come on the stage and tell them they, if they don't take off the shirts immediately, they're suspended. And that shows you that's the power of, of influence. Because those kids in Union, New Jersey have nothing to do with those two men's beef. Correct. You know what I'm saying? And so, and so you 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 have the influence of these kids, and you know, so you trickle it back a couple of years, and yeah. the same thing happens with me. You know, so in in a way, you know, I don't think. I never showed up to a school and everybody had on biggie shirts and threw snowballs at me, but you know what I'm saying. You know, so, and, and that, I should have asked this earlier. Before y'all got you and Big got kicked out the club, did, did you pound it out? Did you did you no. laugh, joke about it? Did no, like we never got a chance conversation in? Y'all gotta go. <laughs> there was no. It was we were just going back and forth. I was watching my boys do the moonwalk. And I remember, I remember C's coming in between us and was like, yo, man, y'all don't, this ain't, this ain't dope. You know, like, what are y'all doing? 
And I was like, no, we're not, you know, and we were like, no, 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 no. And then it turned into a, you know, everybody leave. Got you. All right. Um, before I wrap this thing up, you have uh, successfully transitioned from rapper to full-time producer. You have scored movies. You've done your thing out there. Uh, one story I find extremely interesting uh, because I want to talk about two things. Number one, I want to talk about you producing uh, for Will Smith. Mm -hmm. I, I heard that, that people told you they, they didn't want you to produce um, for Will. That's insane. And then secondly, one of my favorite artists uh, is Vivian Green. Oh, word. Go. That project came together. So so talk, talk to me about Will first and then let's segue to Vivian. So, Will, I got a production deal. I got a very big um, publishing deal, I'm sorry, which I recommend people do not do. But I got this huge publishing deal, and the ink wasn't even dry yet, and I got the call to do to work with Will um, on his comeback record. And when I told my publisher, they were like, um, we don't advise that. And if you do that, we may we may have to restructure the deal. And so me and my attorney was like, no, a deal is a deal. The deal is signed. The money's paid. I'm not giving money back. <laughs> and I'm not turning this into a larger advance than what's already been given. So we go in and do this record called Switch. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm not saying it's like, it's not the, the hip hop classic of the world, but it was a number one record in like 18 countries All right. and it did very well globally and it recouped my whole publishing deal within a year. That so, one record? Yeah. They hate, oh man, they was mad. <laughs> they were mad. But I was like, it was one of those, same with the Atlantic Street thing. It was the same thing. I was like, yo, I told you so. Everybody's the same. Everybody has a shot. You know, even when you think this person don't have, people didn't think I have a shot anymore. People thought my time came and went. Every as long as you're in the room, you're part of the you're part of the plant. So, so, so um, yeah, that's that's the long and the short of it. But, they but, but they didn't explain why. Why why wouldn't they want you? you because they thought it was gonna be a flop. They thought that they thought that that my stock my stock as a producer was rising mm -hmm. and they thought by doing that record and it being a flop my stock would drop and i would not get you're only good as your, your last placement right so when they think that you're a flop and you're not going to earn then what happens you know what i'm saying got you yeah and that one record turn around and recoup yeah. the entire <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Okay. How does Vivian Green come into your life? So Vivian, um, a mutual artist that I knew um, that I was working with introduced us and um, she was working, she was just finishing an album and um, she was just finishing an album and, and uh, what, what was it? And I tried to, I was trying to push beats and she shut me down and then she worked on a new album and when she was working on the new album so when we were working on um so i started submitting for this next album that she was working on and she ended up dissolving the relationship that she had with e1 when that, that album was out and so we just kept working and working and working and i was like you know we've you know yeah, I know. I'm pretty pretty sure you'll find another deal. Let's just keep working on music. And um, then I got the opportunity to do my own label through Universal, through Universal Caroline at the time. And I was like, well, I just so happened that be working on this and she needs a project and uh, she needs a, a label home. So I pretty much structured my label Make Noise around her and and that situation and um we did well like we did three albums um through the universal system um ended up having 
how many? Uh, four top 20, three top 10, one went to number two. <laughs> um, but, you know, for f- being in the independent space and back to your thing about being an executive, I totally get it now because I have to do it. You know, my days literally, so so now flash forward, this started in 2015, we're in 2023, fast forward, my production company handles, when speaking of Vivian Green, we handle her situation, we also handle her touring as well. So literally my day is, my day is carved into weird compartments. So me being on the West Coast, I got to get up at 530 every morning. So I hit the nine o'clock business crowd. So from 530 to maybe like 930 is all admin Mm -hmm. stuff. Then I'm, you know, then I, you know, take time to work out or whatever. And then it's studio stuff. And then every weekend from, you know, from Thursday to from Friday, Thursday, Friday to Monday, Tuesday, we on the road. So, you know, I'm juggling all those aspects. So now like, so to, like I said, to go back and answer your previous question, maybe I wasn't equipped or ready to be in some sort of um, administrative or executive um, business position. But trust me now that's, I am thrown in it and I hate it. No. <laughs> I want to be in the studio all day long, you know? So yeah, I got, I, I got to deal with it. And, you know, so after, after Vivian, there's other artists now that are on deck that are coming out through that situation that are going to come out. And, you know, I probably won't play all of them so close to the hip, but Vivian's projects, are extremely close to the hip because those are the, that that was the catalyst that brought in other opportunities. And then with Viv, she's a dope songwriter as well. So, like the other R and B artists, we we'll be in there like Ashford and Simpson at times and and working on their stuff. Or even like the like we just did a um a holiday film together. And she, you know, I scored the whole thing and she wrote all the songs. So it it it's just like a snowball effect. But different creative things that we do. So um, yeah, I, I super appreciate it. But trust me, man, it drives me crazy at times. Like, So you literally are still on the road with her every weekend? Yeah, I'm in Atlanta this weekend. Wow. Uh, what is Atlanta is this weekend? So I'm on the road in three capacities. Mm-hmm. So I go on the road with her because the way the show is structured, I handle all the the business to it, but at the same time, I um well not just me. I have a whole staff that handles the business, but my narcissistic self, <laughs> I got to be on stage too. So I'm like the DJ, and so like you know we'll go in, she'll do her stuff, and then we'll go into a DJ set, and then go back to some more stuff because she has like seven albums to cover, and um, so from there that's one thing, and then I have this collective called the Alumni. So when I want to do my old school thing, the alumni is myself, Special Ed, Chub Rock, Moni Love, and Dana Dane, and Nice and Smooth. And we all have a collective together. We all get on stage together like a like a super group, and we just do our records back to back to back to back to back to back. And um, so we're on a roll with that. And then promoters get up enough courage and they call me out to do to do <sighs> shows as well. So my weekends is usually one of the three or all three. There's times where literally I can be go from one show and run to the next show. And sometimes I, I'll try to route things and, you know, because the R&B crowd and the old school hip hop crowd may not be the same thing. So I can Correct. route things and be in the same vicinity within the same weekend. So yeah, I'd I be moving, man. Seriously. Nah, it's crazy. And and damn, I would love to see a, a, an alumni show. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, um, we have something coming. I'm trying to think of the closest thing. 
Hold on. Schedules are good. <laughs> I don't think. Um, yeah, I think our next thing is Indianapolis. Uh, and not Atlantic City. Atlantic City is going to be ill. That's a that's a thing where they're doing a 50th anniversary of hip hop and it's 50 yeah. artists. Yep, I see it promoted. Yeah. Yeah, our next thing is like Midwest, North Northern California, in Indianapolis, Houston, Rochester. Yeah, we're not. We're in. Well, next time you would take either which way. Atlanta is, is the closest East Coast thing that we're doing, and that's in September. Well, my brother, I'm gonna tell you, th this has been my pleasure. Um, I, I have enjoyed our conversation. It, it it has been fun, informative, and you know, at the end of the day, I, I, I love talking to to because this is the 50th year of hip hop. Yeah, yeah. I'm trying to make it my my personal duty to speak to as many artists and producers and, and executives who really put bricks in this thing that has shaped all of our lives. Um, so having the opportunity to sit down with you, you know, I, I, I can tell you, I am truly, truly grateful. Thank you so much for the time Thank you. And, 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 and the good energy and the great stories, my brother. Thank you for having me. And, and for the people that don't know, I was 30 minutes late. <laughs> So I apologize publicly. But, but you gave us one hell of an interview, though. Thank you, man. Thank you for having me, seriously. Kwame, continue love, peace, blessings, and success, my brother. Thanks, man. Thank you. Thank you. You also. My brother. All right, man. Peace. What's up, guys? Thanks for sticking with me to the end of the video. Truly appreciate you. If you like anything you heard here today, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. And if you know anybody that can benefit from this message, feel free to share. Peace and love. Make every move a power move. And I'll catch you all on the next video.